uh, MBA50 video interviews. I'm uh, delighted to have with me uh, Nimalia Kumar, who's a professor of marketing at uh, the London Business School. He's also the director of the Center for Marketing here at the school and co-director of the Aditya Burla India Center. Um, thank you very much for being with us for the interview. My pleasure. Um, publication of your new book, uh, which seems a good place to start. Perhaps you could tell us beyond stereotypes and hyperbole what you've put your finger on for the Indian economy. So, so basically this book uh, asks a very interesting question, at least for an Indian. It says if the Indians are so smart, then where are the Indian Googles, iPods and Viagras? Where's the innovation? And so we started off with that question and very quickly we realized that when we interviewed people to ask them, you know, why do, why do you think we don't see any Indian Googles, iPods and Viagras? They said, well, you know, the reason is that the Indians are good software programmers and accountants, but they're not very creative. I said, okay, fine. The more sophisticated people said, well, you know, it's not that they're not creative. It's just that the kind of education system they have in India doesn't really, you know, develop creativity. Fine. I said, where do I find creative people? They told me, go to Silicon Valley. Off I went to Silicon Valley to the most creative companies. They told me, Microsoft, Intel, Google. I said, okay, let's go to the R&D labs and the innovation centers of these three companies. In each case, I found that an Indian was the head of the innovation center. So I said, you must not have been born and brought up in India because you know those guys are not very innovative. In each case, they had got their full education in India before they went for their final degree to America. So clearly there's nothing. And then we went to Bangalore, which is the Silicon Valley of India. And we tried to look at what's happening there. And what we found was that the question is wrong. Uh, the Googles, iPods, and Viagras are a certain kind of innovation. They are the kind of innovation that the end user sees as a customer. But there's a lot of other kinds of innovation that's happening in India, which we call invisible innovation. And that's why we call this book India Inside. In every product that you're using today, including this camera, some part of it was developed in India. It's just that it's not branded India Inside. Right. So, you see? so it's a branding issue. So it's a branding issue. So, and the kind of innovation that you're seeing over there is on many different kinds of invisible innovation that we outline in the book. One, but just to give you one example is process innovation. It's only in India that millions of young people, smart, educated, dream of working in a call center. So what happens when you get these millions of young kids and you choose them and you put them in a call center, where very quickly they realize that this is a very boring job. And then they start innovating. And you see all these call centers in India have got what we call an injection of intelligence compared to what they would get if they were located in the West. Now, of course, in the Indian education system, the likes of uh, Jay Krishnamurti talked about the importance of encouraging the creativity of a child and, and that inquisitive mind. That also applies to a seven-year-old and a 27-year-old. In fact, I would say that the most important thing you can learn at a school like London Business School or Harvard or Stanford, wherever you go, uh, is that you build your own antenna for curiosity, that you're always learning oriented. Because what you learn in our school is really not going to help you too much in your career. It's what you keep learning based on what we have taught you that's going to keep you successful. Because every because people don't learn just from a book. They learn when they face a situation that they have to solve the problem. You see? And when you solve the problem, the answers in the book give you some hints, but they're not going to give you the solution for this particular problem. And so the people who are really the good managers and I've had the good fortune of you know interacting with let's say hundred of the top five hundred company CEOs is they have a curiosity, they're constantly learning, they have an absorptive capacity to absorb from many people. So that I remember one of my favorite moments was I was on a plane and I ran into the chairman of Nestle and uh, he told me, uh, you're from that school where I went and heard a lecture. I said, yeah. He said, I liked what you said. And he repeated to me in a one hour lecture the one point that he should have remembered of the lecture if he forgot everything else. And that shows you that absorptive capacity. The person listens to hundreds of lectures, but from each lecture, the one or two critical lessons they retain. Right. You know? And that's what keeps people. So if you're curious, you have a learning uh, and an inquisitive mind, and you are constantly on the lookout for new ideas, because you know, they're coming to you every day. Right. Now, of course, you've been busy uh, writing. Um, but perhaps also busy reading as well, and text on quantitative economics. Um, a good book that you've read in the last uh, year that made an impact on you. Yeah, see now, the, the thing is that, you know, uh, good books in business 
even my own, are few and far in between. Okay, most of them are not that insightful. But so most of the reading I tend to do is I tend to do outside business to get my ideas. I read this wonderful book. It's called Yo uh, Young Geniuses and Old Masters. So what this book does is, it's written by a University of Chicago professor. He looks at art and painters, since one of my passions is art. And he says, do artists produce their best work when they're young, start of their career, or at the end of their career? And he finds there are two kinds of artists. There are those are artists who are working within a tradition who are experimentalists. They produce their best work at the end of the career because they're learning a skill across the life and they're experimenting. And he uses Cezanne as the example of that. And then there are those artists who are radical, who break all norms. They produce their best works early in the career, and after that, they become a bit repetitive in, within that realm, right? And he uses Picasso as an example of that. You know, that uh, though Picasso is one of the few who actually kept reinventing himself, but even then, his best works come early in his career. Mm -hmm. You know, so it kind of made me think. You know, I said, yeah. So if you think about companies. The companies that are working for 100 years, they have to be like the experimentalists, continuously improve and become better. And the companies like Facebook or Google, they are like radical. You know, they do their best work early in their, in, their, in their life. You know, And then they have this challenge of becoming experimental over time and improving slowly, slowly. So you start off with a radical innovation, but then you become incremental over time. If I look at academics, did my best idea come when I was first early writings, or will it come at the end? of my career, you know. So, you know, so you start, so one of the things about learning is to read broadly and then try to find connections which are non-intuitive, you know. And, and you struggle to do that, you know. And sometimes a student will always tell me, yeah, but how can I apply this this morning? I said, this is not, edu this is not that kind of learning, you know. Mm -hmm. This is not a driving lesson, mm -hmm. you know. This is an education that you're getting two years for your life. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't have to apply tomorrow morning or day after morning. Some of my best lessons I learned, I only realized I learned them 10 years later. Right. You know, so I think, you know, so for me, I read broadly. I read out of business mostly. And in steering clear of the business school books, perhaps it also saves you from, from the business school uh, or the business jargon. Um, are or, there terms that or, we know, use that... Uh, not only the jargon, it, it saves me from having uh, this feeling that everything I'm going to write has already been written before. <laughs> That's good news to your yeah, publishers. Too. Exactly, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, because all ideas are old, kind of. <laughs> well, with your interests in art, uh, my final question might be, if you went to a business school professor and, of course, the author that you are, what might you be? So, you know, I used to be a DJ. Uh, and uh, that was because uh, I realized very early in my career that I couldn't be a blues player. Ah. So then I became a DJ. Right. You know, but if I hadn't done this, then I would have been a DJ Great. or run a blues bar. Both of those are still, <laughs> still open to you. Yes, They're still open to me, yes. Well, many thanks for, for sharing uh, such a, a broad range of thoughts. It was a pleasure to, to spend the afternoon with it you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank Best you. of luck. Thank you.